Kamala Harris traded her disingenuous cackle for a disingenuous shriek over the weekend when she attacked Florida Governor Ron DeSantis over his state's new curriculum, which she insists praises the benefits of slavery. This is unnecessary to debate whether enslaved people benefited from slavery. Are you kidding me? Are we supposed to debate that? Let us not be distracted by what they're trying to do, which is to create unnecessary debates to divide our country. Now, of course, that is not what the curriculum states. We've got the text that the new Florida standards state, quote, instructional materials shall include the vital contributions of African Americans to build and strengthen American society and celebrate the inspirational stories of African Americans who prospered even in the most difficult circumstances. The supposedly controversial section that Kamala was referring to simply acknowledges that, quote, slaves developed skills which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit, which is obviously true. This is the thesis of Booker T. Washington's book, Up From Slavery. This is the premise of much of Frederick Douglass's writing. This is what was going through the mind of the black, black historian, William B. Allen, when he wrote the supposedly racist, offensive standards. What's more important than that dishonest purpose is the truth. And this curriculum is devoted to telling the truth, whereas Kamala Harris has retailed a lie. Now, it may only have been a falsehood the first time she stated it, but when you repeat a falsehood, it becomes a lie. This curriculum is about is having people who live the experience, who live the history, tell their stories. And nothing is more important than that we never, ever erase the stories that the people who live the stories tell. No one has a right to interpret before first understanding the stories as the people who lived them understood them themselves. The biggest problem with Kamala's attack is not the dishonesty. That's par for the course. The problem is the claim that she's attacking is true. It's a deep and enduring truth. Slaves benefited from enduring hardship, just as everyone can benefit from enduring hardship. And the fashionable insistence that suffering is always bad is making us a nation that is weak, confused, and depressed because we can't make sense of human nature and the fact of a fallen world. On that chipper note, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. This episode is brought to you by Good Ranchers. Get great meat at a secure price and 30 bucks off your order with code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Knowles today. Republican Congress lady Nancy Mace made a joke about fornicating at the National Prayer Breakfast. It's caused quite a stir and most reactions I've seen to it are wrong. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, first, though, speaking of historical revision, a new gay historical figure just dropped. You know this happens every, every few years now. The libs will take some well-known historical figure and then just decide out of the blue that he's a gay guy or a lesbian or so, some other kind of marginalized identity that we all know he isn't. So the, the, new, the new historical figure that the libs are trying to rainbow wash, they're trying to paint him lavender, is the poet Alfred Lord Tennyson. And you might know Alfred Lord Tennyson, even if you're not a big poetry buff, you might know him because one of his poems, Crossing the Bar, is frequently read at funerals. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me, and may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. You may have heard that one. A wonderful poet. Uh, I've, I've always really liked Tennyson. And n- never suspected that he was a gay guy. And the reason I never suspected that is that he was married for over 40 years and had two children. And uh, an, another reason I never suspected that is that there's no evidence whatsoever that he is a little light in the old loafers. So where do they get this from? This is the saddest part of the story for me. This is the saddest part of the modern impulse to queer historical figures. 
the evidence that this LGBT group, it's called the LGBT Heritage Trail in the UK, the evidence that they say they have that Tennyson is a gay guy is that he had a friend. Their evidence is that uh, Tennyson had this friend, Arthur Henry Hallam, and he wrote a very famous poem to him. It's called In Memoriam A-H-H. And it's where we get that line, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Hallam, there is no evidence whatsoever that Hallam had a romantic relationship with Tennyson or that Tennyson desired a romantic relationship with Hallam or anything like that. They were college buddies. They were in a debating society together. They were good friends. They traveled together. They corresponded quite a lot. They obviously had a, a deep love, the love of friendship for one another. But not only did they not have any romantic love, Hallam was engaged to Tennyson's sister. So Hallam would have been his brother-in-law. And, and the, the reason that I think that the libs maybe sincerely, maybe earnestly believe that these older historical figures were gay is because they don't understand friendship because men are not really allowed to have friends anymore. Modern culture is just shocked absolutely bewildered by the suggestion that a man can have a deep friendship. Because in as much as men are permitted to have friends in modern society, the only kind of friends men are allowed to have is the sort of uh, go out and get hammered or come over and watch the game kind of friend. That's fine. But the moment that a man has a friend with whom he discusses things that really matter, with whom he uh, talks about eternal questions in whom he confides, with whom he has an actual friendship, you know, in the, the old kind of Aristotelian sense of a deep friendship, a friendship of truth and virtue, but then he's got to be a gay guy because we just can't fathom that. But, you know, we're in a very lonely society in a very alienated society where self-reported rates of loneliness and depression and alienation have just skyrocketed in recent years. This is one of the reasons why. I'm not saying that no historical figures were a little bit uh, queer, uh, someone like Walt Whitman was probably a little light in the moccasins. But when you go to someone like Tennyson, and there's just no evidence of it whatsoever, other than the fact that he had a friend, <laughs> that is an indictment of our society. And I think it lies at the heart of a lot of the sexual confusion and a lot of the political dysfunction. The fact that people don't have true friends anymore. We have friends of convenience. We have friends of, of work, friends by accident. You know, you work with someone and maybe you go get a drink with them afterward. You have friends of shared interests, like you both like Spider-Man or something, so you connect over that. But proper friendship, you know, friendship of the good, hard to find, especially in a society that's so relativistic and liberal that we deny the very existence of the good. And so now we look back and we take really good, strong, traditional conservative poets and say that they were little, a little bit uh, eccentric. I don't think so. I don't think so, man. When you want to be sure of something, none of this confusion, when you want to be sure of something, like a good dinner, you got to check out Good Ranchers. Right now, go to goodranchers.com, use promo code Knowles. You know that I love anything made with top of the line quality. For me, that's Good Ranchers. The only thing missing is a pork box. Okay, I've said it for a long time. Well, if you ask for it, they deliver. Good Ranchers has just launched their prime pork, 100% American pork, that is steakhouse quality. This new pork box comes with bone-in, which is my favorite, and boneless pork chops, sausage, smoked brats, and more. Plus, right now, you will get 30 bucks off with code Knowles at GoodRanchers.com. On their site, you can explore their all-American cuts of prime pork, prime beef, better-than-organic chicken options, if you've tried their beef and chicken before, you know how amazing it is. I have said this for a long time. I fear that I haven't conveyed it. There is no service on the market that gets you anywhere near the quality of Good Ranchers, and Good Ranchers has the most competitive prices around. It's one of the few things I missed when I was in Hungary. Head on over right now. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Knowles. 30 bucks off any box. That is promo code Knowles, Canada WLAS, at GoodRanchers.com. GoodRanchers.com. American meat delivered. Speaking of sexual confusion, Nancy Mace, Republican Congress lady. She's a liberal Republican, but I, I kind of like her. She's, she's been on the right side of at least a handful of issues, and 
She's clearly a little bit lost and trying to figure things out. And that's true of a lot of people in modern culture. Well, Nancy Mace really stepped in it because she showed up to the national prayer breakfast and decided to open her remarks with a joke about how she almost fornicated before showing up to the event. Another year, another standing room only event. And when I woke up this morning at 7, I was getting picked up at 7.45. Patrick, my fiance, tried to pull me by my waist over this morning in bed. And I was like, no, baby, we don't got time for that this morning. Uh, I got to get to the prayer breakfast. And I got to be on time. And a little TMI. But um, I... He'll, he can wait. He's got, we got, I'll see him later tonight. Um, but I was here early today. It's just so cringe. And this is the defining feature of Nancy Mace's political persona. And it's, it's very sad and she should try to nip it in the bud. And a lot of other conservatives who are, who are tempted this way should nip it in the bud too. It's not the sex stuff. It's that she always wants to be the cool conservative. She's like the mom on Mean Girls. She wants, I'm not a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. I'm not a regular conservative. I'm a cool conservative. I'm not a regular Christian. You know, I'm a cool Christian. I almost fornicated with a man who's not my husband this morning, but don't worry, I'm going to do it later tonight. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about God and prayer. Ah, oh, man, good grief, lady. Just read the room. Read the room and recognize that there are more important things in life than being considered cool by the liberals who hate you, who hate you, no matter how irreverent you are, no matter how much you try to distinguish yourself from your political party and the conservatives and your supporters, they will never like you. You're a Republican, okay? Your, your best option to be cool is to reject the standards of coolness of the liberal culture, which which way lies madness and which will always hate you, and to be a conservative. And be, she says she's a Christian. But, but here's how she says it. She says, when she was defending these remarks, she said, I go to church because I'm a sinner, not a saint. Glad those in attendance, including Senator Tim Scott and my pastor, her pastor was in attendance. How disgraceful for him that she would do this. Took this joke in stride. But it, what was it a joke? It was a joke in that she intended for it to be funny, but I don't think she's joking that she sleeps with her fiance. I think that part, unless maybe she was joking about that and it was all, just a whole bit, but I don't think it is judging by her other comments. Because Pastor Greg, of course his name is Pastor Greg. Pastor Greg and I will have extra to talk about on Sunday. Ha ha ha. And there's a little laughing face emoji. Yes, of course. We go to church because we are sinners in this fallen world. We're, we're subject to concupiscence and sin and death pervade the world. And, you know, it's a tough go of it here and it's a pilgrimage and we pray for grace, of course. There but for the grace of God go I. All, all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. You don't need to brag about it because that will, one, suggest that you're not really sorry for your sins. You haven't really repented. You're just brazenly uh, continuing in a state of grave mortal sin, which again describes a lot of the world. The difference is you're at least putatively a Christian at a Christian prayer breakfast. And, and then furthermore, you're incurring the sin of scandal because you're leading others astray by saying this is what Christians do. And you're, you're implicating your pastor in that sin also. I, I recognize it's a very messed up culture and catechesis is really weak these days and people don't really know how they're supposed to behave. I have a great deal of sympathy and empathy even for all of that. But this is a real indictment uh, of this lady's pastor, of whatever ecclesial community Pastor Greg seems to be leading. It doesn't seem to be forming souls all that well if these are the kind of jokes that his flock make at, at national prayer breakfasts. And it raises the question, why was she invited to speak? What Ah, man, what are these people going after? It's the conservatives and the, the nominal Christians in our culture. What are they going after? Do they, do, they, do they want to establish a big tent and accommodate themselves to the way of the world and the way of the decadent, degraded liberal culture to try to win some elections or fill up the pews or something like that? Or do they want to speak the truth and speak the truth come what may because to, to win some kind of nominal victory 
by adopting all of your opponent's beliefs and premises and behaviors is no victory at all. It's a Pyrrhic victory. It's a concession. It's a surrender. It's a loss. It's like that good old line, which I'll attribute to Fulton Sheen. A few different people uh, lay claim to this line. If you marry yourself to the spirit of the age, you'll find yourself a widow in the next. If you, if you wedge yourself to the spirit of liberalism as a conservative, then you haven't won anything. You're just, you're just, you're a big lib. And this is of course, especially true in the case, if you're a Christian and you say, I'm a Christian, but I just do all the things that the world tell me to do. And I just try to seem cool by the standards of this fallen world, which is under the rule of, of the devil himself, then that's not a victory, man. That's a loss. Then what does it even mean to say you're a Christian? You know, I was in Hungary last week and I'll, I'll publish the text of my speech that I gave at the big political conference there. I'll publish it on Daily Wire, and I think there's going to be a video that goes up soon enough. Uh, But the topic of my speech was how salvation hinges on the flesh, which is a line from Tertullian, the early Christian writer, that the flesh itself is the hinge of salvation. In modernity, we like to think that my faith is just something that lives in my head. You know, look, maybe I sin all the time and I lead others into sin and I laugh about it and I brag about it and I don't do anything to try to stop it. But hey, if I think in my head that I'm a Christian, then I'm a Christian. Even in the political realm, I, I, can, li- I can move to a city, I cannot get married, I cannot have kids, I cannot take virtue seriously, I cannot go to church, I cannot do anything other than go to brunch and live according to the modern liberal culture. But if I tell myself I'm a conservative, then I'm a conservative. No, man, you got to do it. We live in time and space. We, and especially when we're talking about Christianity, we're talking about a religion that views the incarnation and the crucifixion and the resurrection as the very pivot and meaning of history. It, it's the most historically focused religion that there is, meaning time and space and actions of real men in flesh and blood in places. Hungary gets this, which is why Hungary has reordered its law and its culture to uh, better accommodate people who are trying to pursue goodness and truth and beauty. You see it in the beauty of the buildings that the, the government is actively trying to restore. You see this in the truth of the eternal principles that the government is enshrining in its constitution and its laws. And you see this in the clear moral vision that the Hungarian government has laid out, which is nothing new. It's just the traditional moral vision of our Christian civilization, which the liberal Uh, societies either ignore or invert and say that good is evil and evil is good. That's, you got to do stuff. And let's say that Nancy Mace keeps sinning or whatever. You know, we all sin at different times, but we should be ashamed of that. We should not brag about it in public. We should go seek absolution and forgiveness. Speaking of love, marriage, and the baby carriage, some good news. Joe Biden is finally acknowledging his granddaughter, you know, I've harangued him on this show for a long time because I say it's the, the worst thing that I could say about Joe Biden. Forget about all the corruption and the scandals and taking money from the Ukrainians and the lies and all the rest of it. The meanest thing that I've ever seen him do is not acknowledge his sweet little four-year-old granddaughter and intentionally not acknowledge her. Omit her stocking from the White House Christmas display. Constantly say, I only have six grand, grandchildren, not seven. Finally, though, uh, Biden acknowledges her. Why is he acknowledging her? In a statement to People magazine, uh, Biden says, our son Hunter and Navy's mother, London, are working together to foster a relationship that is in the best interests of their daughter, preserving their privacy as much as possible going forward. First of all, that's not true. Hunter refuses to even speak to this daughter. Hunter just went to court to try to stop paying the mother child support. Uh, Hunter, or to, to greatly reduce the child support that he was paying. Hunter also just sued to stop the daughter from having his last name. In no way, there is zero evidence that Hunter Biden is trying to establish a relationship in the best interests of the daughter. Hunter is trying to completely screw his daughter over and, and, and mess her up and traumatize her in every way possible. That's all the evidence that we have. And Joe Biden's complicit in that because it's not like some private little spat between a, a man and his baby mama and a, a child born out of wedlock. And you say, well, it's private life. We're talking about the granddaughter of the president of the United States, whether they want to or not, this is a public matter that they have to address. The little girl is going to know that her daddy, that her granddaddy rather is the president of the United States. And it's going to traumatize her if her granddaddy is so ashamed of her that he won't acknowledge her existence. And he's, he's continued it that way for four years now. 
The girl's almost four years old. So anyway, now he finally says, okay, I'm going to acknowledge her. Good on him. Good on him. Except he was only bullied into it by a liberal columnist at the New York Times. Maureen Dowd wrote this column that said the president's cold shoulder and heart is counter to every message he's sent for decades, and it's out of sync with the America he wants to continue to lead. Very true. So he finally got bullied into it because, as we've seen in some other campaign leaks, this is becoming a big political liability for him. And so he dumps this news on a Friday afternoon via written statement I would not hold my breath about him keeping up his promise. He's a dirty, rotten liar, (laughs) has been for his whole political career, and he somehow made a bad situation even worse in the cynical way that he's tried to address a, a, a basic aspect of being a decent human being. Classic Joe Biden. We gotta restore some balance to our relationships. You gotta restore some balance to nature and to your body. That's why you gotta go check out Balance of Nature. Right now, go to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code Knowles. Fruits and veggies are a great way to make sure you're getting essential nutritional ingredients every single day. Through Balance of Nature's advanced cold vacuum process, the vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients of the fruits and vegetables are preserved so that you can get that vital nutrition in each capsule. Balance of Nature is a whole food supplement with no additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. Pure fruits and veggies are the only things they put in their capsules. Balance of Nature sent a bunch of their products down to the studio for our team to try. We all love them. When you're disciplined enough to take care of your health, you reap all kinds of benefits. Your body will thank you for a limited time this summer. When you become a preferred customer of Balance of Nature, they're throwing in a free fruits and veggies travel set and giving an additional 25 bucks off your first order. Go to balanceofnature.com, use promo code Knowles for a free travel set and 25 bucks off your first order as a preferred customer. That's balanceofnature.com. Promo code K-N-O-W-L-E-S. Speaking of the president, Joe Biden, there's a new poll out from Monmouth. Almost half of Republicans think that Donald Trump is the strongest candidate to take on Joe Biden. That does not mean that Trump is doing really, really well in the polls, though he obviously is. This is a different question. Almost half of Republicans think that Trump is the strongest candidate to take on Biden. The argument thus far for a DeSantis or Nikki Haley or Tim Scott or Mike Pence or Vivek Ramaswamy even is, well, look, the base likes Trump, but he can't win the general. Everyone knows he can't win the general, but but unfortunately, the way the primary process is set up, the, the far right candidate sometimes can win the primary and then we'll lose the general because a more moderate candidate would do better in the general. Now, we covered on the last show, moderate candidates as the GOP nominee have a much worse track record than the conservative GOP nominees for president. Much worse. Go back to the last show. I won't won't go through the litany again, but going back to Eisenhower, after Eisenhower, you see a, a much stronger showing from the conservative nominees than from the John McCain's and the Mitt Romney's. But furthermore, this is now another knock on the DeSantis campaign because the DeSantis campaign can at least say, look, maybe people don't feel as passionately about me as they do about Donald Trump, but everyone knows I'm more likely to beat Joe Biden than Trump is. A poll like this says, no, the the DeSantis campaign has not convinced Republicans of that. So you got 45% of GOP voters view Trump as definitely the best candidate to beat Biden. In addition, 24% on top of that, say he is probably the strongest candidate to defeat, to face Biden. So this is a huge number. Only 13% of Republicans said definitely another candidate, and only 18% said another candidate would probably be stronger than Trump. So you add those numbers up, all of a sudden, you're at 69% say Trump is definitely or probably the strongest candidate. And you get down here to 31% say that some other candidate is definitely or probably the strongest. It's, it's something that the talking class, the punditariat, the GOP establishment, but even the, even the conservative establishment, which very often lives in Washington, D.C. or New York or, or even Los Angeles and very often occupy elite circles, uh, just the nature of the business, uh, they don't seem to recognize very often. Trump changes the calculus It's not just a matter of policy positions. It's not just a matter of going to Ballotopedia and seeing where the candidates stand on the issues. He's just a different kind of animal. 
He talks different. He walks different. He's got a different background and he appeals to different people. And he, he turns off certain voters who the more clubbable kind of Republicans sometimes can impress. But he also attracts voters that the more clubbable Republicans have, have never been able to impress or haven't been able to impress since Ronald Reagan. So what does this mean for the rest of the field? Well, the rest of the field is going to keep on fighting, including the number two guy right now, Ron DeSantis, who just came out to attack the clubbable Republicans. If you can't stand up for the protection of children, then what good are you as a governor? I mean, honestly, this is just... This is just nonsense. These are like these Chamber of Commerce Republicans. You know, whatever the corporations want, they, they bow down to. And that doesn't work in a free society. It doesn't work to have a just society because corporate America, unfortunately, has become polluted with ideology and they're pursuing agendas. And the sexualization of children is wrong. And we are going to do battle with anybody that's seeking to rob our, our children of their innocence. Great line. I love it. I love that DeSantis is going after the Chamber of Commerce Republicans. It's a reminder that Ron DeSantis, even though now because he's running against Trump, he is attracting a number of establishment people to support him. Ron DeSantis, in his political outlook and promises and campaign platform, is much closer to Donald Trump than he is to Mitt Romney or John McCain or the Bushes, or maybe even Ronald Reagan. He, Ron DeSantis is running a populist, anti-corporate, anti-big business campaign. This means that all of the top GOP candidates right now are running against the Chamber of Commerce. A lot of the GOP candidates are running while placating the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mike Pence, most clearly, he said, well, look, we're, we support business. We don't want to be against business when he was attacking Ron DeSantis. But Mike Pence and basically all of the candidates below Mike Pence in the polls, they're all running as the kind of pro-business, pro-chamber, typical country club GOP that you've seen. The top three candidates right now, Trump, DeSantis, and Vivek Ramaswamy, are all actively, explicitly running against the Chamber of Commerce, and big business. That is a major shift in the GOP in my lifetime, and that's a shift for the better. Because we're recognizing that there's more, more to life than just ticking up the GDP numbers. And a strong economy is good, but a strong economy is not the be-all and end-all. Because if you make that the absolute end of politics, as many in the establishment and libertarian camp had done for the 90s and the 2000s and into the 20-teens, then we're no different than the mammon-worshipping materialists that we mock on the left and that we're fighting against. That you want, you want a good economy. That's a very valuable thing in society, but you don't want to put the cart before the horse. You want the good economy in service of a good country. And if the corporations are undermining the values and the behaviors and the traditions and the virtues of your country, well, then they need to be brought into line. We need to recognize that the market exists for us to have a good society. Our society does not exist to serve the market. Now, what about that third candidate, Vivek Ramaswamy? Vivek is a little different from Trump and DeSantis in that Vivek is trying to cut a middle ground between the new, more nationalist, more populist, anti-corporate uh, spirit of the GOP. Obviously, Vivek wrote a book called Woke Inc. and has, is regularly described as the anti-woke businessman. So he's, he's got that part going for him, but he's also trying to preserve some of the classically liberal libertarian tendencies of the GOP in the last 10 to 30 years. So Vivek just came out and urged more free trade and more legal migration. The CPTPP, I think we should re-enter it. I think this is a little bit different than what, you know, the, the course of action taken by Trump in exiting the TPP. I think that was actually maybe, maybe a poor decision. I think that I can use the leverage of the fact that we did exit it to be able to say, all right, here's what we need done differently in a number of the countries from Japan on down to be able to say, here's how we re-enter that on fairer terms. 
And so that's what I'd like to see. That puts us in then a strong position from a trade perspective to then take a look at where we stand vis-a-vis China. So I, I could go on for hours on this one. So we want to remain mer- uh, really merit focused. We want to obviously, um, I think, try to attract the people from around the world who are also merit focused and wish to join the con- country. Um, and we should make it much easier for them to join. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree with that. I it, actually fully agree with that. It, and yeah. <clears throat> that's one of the things where I think the Republican Party needs to define where we actually stand. There is an anti-legal immigration current that, you know, which is which, which, I, which I'm going to be on the debate stage in a month. And this yeah. is going to be something that if anybody has uh, any any qualms with this, uh, you know, I think I'm going to have a real problem with that because merit based immigration yeah. is one of the fixes to economic growth in this country. So he's right about that last part. Uh, mass migration, mass legal migration has been in service of keeping the economy afloat because people aren't having kids anymore. And that's true, not just in America, it's true throughout the West. But that's still a problem. It's a problem because if you just flood your country with foreigners and you don't assimilate them as we haven't been able to do in 50 years, then you're going to lose the things that, that distinguish your country. Also because there's more to a country than just keeping the GDP up, though of, of course you don't want the economy to collapse. But this is this is an issue that probably won't come up on the debate stage because none of the candidates, as far as I can tell, support a reduction in legal migration. They all say we want to end illegal immigration, but we, we, want, we want a lot of legal immigration. Trump, Trump himself, who's the most anti-immigrant major candidate in my lifetime, he said we want more legal immigration than ever. And this is a problem, one, because I think it, it not only threatens the national identity, and cultural coherence, and the the notion that we're actually a country defined by borders with a, a real citizenry that's distinct from foreigners. But two, because the, the majority of Americans want to drastically reduce immigration. They don't usually say it in those terms. They won't say, I'm anti-legal immigrant. If you just ask them that question, do you want more or less legal immigration? They'll often say more or keep it the same. But if you ask them, what do you think would be a good number for migration? Then you find out, and there was a a famous Harvard-Harris poll that came out a few years ago on this point, you find out that people want drastically lower immigration, like 60% lower, legal and illegal, because uh, very often people will say, well, about half a million people a year, and that's nowhere near what we've got. We've got got double that just in terms of legal immigration, and then this year alone, we're going to have over three and a half million people apprehended crossing the border illegally. Who knows what the real number is? So now you're talking about a huge, huge number. Uh, no candidate is speaking to that right now. I think if a candidate did say, look, we, it's nothing against foreigners. It's nothing against people from all sorts of cultures, but our culture is collapsing and we have very little that unifies us anymore, including even the same language. We don't even really speak the same language anymore. We need, as we have done in American history a number of times, we need to drastically reduce all immigration in order to regain some sense of coherence and cohesion for our people. And then in 50 or 60 years, maybe we can open it back up a little bit again. Uh, What does this mean for the race? It means that Vivek is trying to cut more of that classically liberal view while still maintaining populist and nationalist cred. Uh, The the migration issue won't hurt him because nobody is talking about reducing legal immigration, unfortunately. Uh, The free trade issue might, because Trump has now come out and said, I'm running on mercantilism for the 21st century. I'm running on protective tariffs, not merely as an instrument to get good free trade deals, but as a good in and of themselves. Uh, Ron DeSantis has been a little unclear on this. We don't quite know exactly where he stands on this issue of trade. And now Vivek is saying, no, I'm, I'm still a free trader. And, and m- maybe it's a smart move for Vivek in that it allows him to distinguish himself from the other top candidates in the field. And now we have to start talking about Vivek, who... Everybody said, oh, it came out of nowhere. No one knows who he is. He is now becoming a top candidate in this field, albeit in a field that is dominated by one candidate over all of the others. But this is going to be a test in 2024. How populist has the GOP become? How traditionally conservative has the GOP become? Don't forget, the GOP was founded on protective tariffs. Conservatives traditionally have been the pro-tariff, pro-protectionism group of people in politics, and the liberals have been the, the free traders. So that shifted a little bit at the end of the 20th century. This is going to be a test. How conservative is this conservative swinging of the pendulum really going to be? 
Now, speaking of woke corporations, are you sick of woke corporations dragging your values through the mud? Wash your hands of it all with Jeremy's brand new hand soap. Jeremy's hand soap is the perfect solution for everyday grit and grime, not to mention it smells amazing as it is scented with green tea and citrus. Not only is it paraben-free, but it's also free of sulfates, DEI, and ESG, for that matter. Plus, it's not tested on animals, and it's made right here in the USA. What more could you want from your hand soap than to get clean hands while keeping a clean conscience? So do yourself a favor and wash your hands of hypocritical libs once and for all. Jeremy's hand soap is the ideal addition to your bathroom or kitchen sink as you liberate your home of the influence of woke companies. Go to jeremysrazors.com and order your green tea and citrus hand soap today. My favorite comment on Friday is from cheesemonk 3 y 127 who says, I used to believe in aliens until the government said they were real. Great observation. It's just so fake, guys. Aliens are angels and demons for liberals. That's all, that's all it is. Probably mostly just demons. That's what it is. That's what it is, man. Okay, before we move on from 2024, just a, a quick button here because there's good news, potentially good news for one of the not top candidates, for Mike Pence, who's had a really rough launch to the campaign, who had a really rough town hall with Tucker Carlson. Uh, He may have a glimmer of hope here to move back up into the race. And it is because Mike Pence over the weekend vowed to reinstate the ban in the military. We can embrace our role as leader of the free world, confront Russian aggression and Chinese provocations with a new military fitted to the challenges in the 21st century. And we can end the political correctness at the Pentagon, including reinstituting a ban on personnel in the United States military. There you have it. Now, I think I'm allowed to keep this part of the show on YouTube. You know, YouTube gets very touchy when I talk about important social issues that are still being debated right now. You can talk about issues that are not being debated anymore, that the libs have already won, but you're not allowed to talk about ones that are still hot. So, uh, I, I think we can keep this part on YouTube because I'm just observing Pence's candidacy. Pence comes out and says, I want to reinstitute the ban in the military. It reminds me that Pence's best shot in this race, which probably won't work, but I think it's his best shot, is to be the hardcore social conservative. Trump is not really a hardcore social conservative. Practically speaking, he's more socially conservative than any president in my lifetime and most other GOP candidates, maybe all of them. But he's a little open on the rainbow stuff. He's a little uh, ambiguous on some of those issues. He's a billionaire from New York. What do you expect? Pence has made his early career as a hardcore social conservative. Right now, you don't totally see that represented in the race. As we just said, Vivek is this great kind of shake it up out of left field candidate, but he's still got a little bit of that classical liberalism to him. Uh, DeSantis is pretty socially conservative, but, but still a really hardcore social conservative could knock DeSantis for the education bill in Florida saying, well, hold on, your education bill just debated whether to introduce a curriculum in third grade or fourth grade? What? Come on, that's, that's weak stuff, man. Now, DeSantis could come back and say, well, don't worry, we expanded that later on, and we've been practically more effective on this issue than anyone else in the country. So he's got a good answer for it, but there's an opening there, is what I'm saying. And the only opening I see right now is that one. What Pence staked his campaign on, and you saw it in the opening video, and you saw it in, in a lot of his campaign since then, is I'm going to be the return to normal. I just want to get along with business as usual and support corporations and just be a nice, normal Republican kind of campaign. Completely dead in the water, man. That's going nowhere. <laughs> your, only, your only light, your only chance here is to double down on this kind of stuff. So he, he might have recognized that. And uh, if he wants the campaign to remain in any way viable, I think he's got to pursue that further. All right, now for the part that I can't keep on YouTube. A uh, t-
Today is Music Monday, baby. And it's Mailbag Monday, a little bit of mailbag, because on Friday, back when I was still in Hungary, I didn't get to as much of the mailbag as I wanted. There were a few questions. I didn't get to any of the written mailbag questions. So we're going to get to a few of them. We're going to get my iPad whenever Professor Jacob gets me my iPad. Where is it? And we're going to get to whatever the song is today. But only if you are a member of the Chem du la Chem, the inner circle of this show. If you are a hoi polloi on YouTube, then you don't get it, man. I'm sorry. You got to go to dailywire.com right now. Use code Knowles. You'll get like a bazillion months free or something. I don't know. Whatever the promo is now. You go to dailywire.com. Use promo code Knowles. They're telling me you will get two months free on all annual plans. And I will get to chat with you momentarily.